Well, Merry Christmas. You may be seated. We are um, kicking off our celebration this evening of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are here tonight um, because our God is a storytelling God, and He is telling a wonderful story. And one of the best parts of it is that you and I can be part of that story. And you're going to hear the story of the birth of Christ as we celebrate his first advent, his first coming, the advents of Christ are simply um, a, a time of reflection and a time of remembrance and a time of anticipation. To, to remember that, that this book is, a, is not just some fictional account, but it is fact. That, that God is telling a story of glory and of grace. He's telling a story of redemption and of restoration and of rescue. And that's ultimately why Jesus Christ came. And during the season of Advent, we've spent four weeks looking at four different aspects of Jesus Christ. We've looked at peace and love and hope and joy. And when we looked at peace, Paul reminded us that the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we found that the peace of God comes from having peace with God in Jesus Christ. And then when we looked at love, we looked at a beautiful scene of the woman who comes in and washes, washes the feet of Jesus with her tears. And Jesus said, For this reason I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven, for she loved much. For he who is forgiven little loves little. And we were reminded that the horizontal love that we're to have for each other um, it's not just this time of year, but especially this time of year, can only come if that vertical love that we have for Christ has been made right through the cross of Jesus Christ. And then Dan taught on hope, and we looked at how hope was brought near by Christ. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul tells us that we were at the, at the time separate from Christ and strangers to the covenants and the promises of God, having no hope and without God in this world. And we found out that our hope is only found in the hope that we have in Christ. And then this morning we looked at joy. And that knowing Jesus brings us joy. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And for every one of those um, different aspects we looked at. We remembered them throughout the week and on Sundays by lighting a candle. And right now we have the Christ candle lit behind me. And at the end of the service, we will do um, our candle lighting. And a candlelight service is just a great picture of the light of Christ being spread throughout his people. And so when we get to that point at the end of the service and you stand to light your candles, I would ask you to, one, be careful, right? Don't, don't get so excited about looking around that you light your neighbor's hair on fire. But two, look around. Take a minute and just sort of take it in and see it for what it is. It's not just a candle and a flame, but it's, it's a picture of how one light can spread among so many others as lives touch each other. As his life, the perfect God-man, touched my life and your life, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and put his light in you, and you go out and touch other lives, and you see that gospel light spread, that's what we will see around this room tonight. Our God is a relational God, right? And ultimately, He came here. He did what only He could do. He came here that we might have relationship with Him. I pray that as you see the, God, the Christmas story maybe um, shared in a little different way through a reading and through music, um, that it isn't just about lights and pretty music, but that it is really about the, the story of the gospel, the good news the Evangelium, the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes hearts and brings to life that which is dead. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that tonight the season of your first advent ends. That we wait no longer. That the greatest event the history, in the history of the world so far is celebrated tonight. You punched a hole in this world and you came here. We celebrate that tonight. Lord, I thank you that the promise of the Redeemer has been fulfilled in your first advent, in your first coming. And the pro promise of the Restorer in your second advent, that where you will restore everything and make it all as it was before the fall. Lord, we, we can trust in the fact that you will fulfill those promises because you have fulfilled all all of your promises up until this point. Lord, I do pray that we would be a people that experience your peace that celebrate your love, that find 
our hope in you, and that are filled with your joy. Lord, I pray tonight in the next few moments that we would see your glory. Glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Jesus' name we pray this, and all God's people said, Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Tonight, we journey back in time and chronicle the earthly arrival of our Savior, the Word in flesh. We will look back at the events that led to the greatest gift the world has ever known. We will begin our journey in the throne room, where God is revealing his plan to Gabriel. Gabriel, you have served the kingdom well. You are a noble messenger. Never have you flinched in your duty. The sound of the Lord's voice stirred Gabriel's heart, and his response was as it always was. Whatever you ask, my Lord, I will do a thousand times over. Of that there is no doubt, dear messenger, but your greatest work lies ahead of you. Your next assignment is to carry the message you have waited eons to deliver, that the great gift of my salvation in my son will be coming to earth. Gabriel was about to depart when he heard a sound that made his back stiffen and smelled an odor that made his stomach turn at the stench. Such a foul odor could come from only one being. Before he even looked to confirm who it was, he drew his sword and turned to do battle with his enemy. But the father put his hand on Gabriel's shoulder and said, Worry not, Gabriel. Lucifer will do no harm here. Lucifer turned toward the father. Even as this leader of the fallen angels said this, he was forced to cover his face, for he could not bear the light given off by God. You speak so confidently, fallen one. I know your plans, God. I remember what you said in the garden, that the seed of Eve would crush my head. But you have failed. No one's not going to come to you before. There are none born of man that can stand against me. There is none who is sinless, not one, not Abraham, not Moses, not Rebecca, not your precious David, not Elijah, not even Samuel. The father stood up from his throne, releasing a wave of holy light so intense that Lucifer staggered backward and fell. Those are my children you mocked. You think you know much, fallen angel, but you know little. Your mind dwells in the valley of self. Your eyes see no further than your knees. Come forward, deceiver. Read from this scroll the name of the one who will call your bluff. Read the name of the one who will storm your gates. God with us. Father motioned toward Gabriel, who bowed once again before his Lord. Now go, my messenger. You will find a girl named Mary. She lives among my chosen people. The fruit of her womb will be the Son of God. Gabriel could not comprehend God's plan, but his understanding was not essential. Only his obedience was. As the angel Gabriel turns to depart, he remembers the words spoken 700 years before through a man by the name Isaiah. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. For I will break the yoke of their slavery, 
and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. The Lord himself will choose the sign. A child shall be born of a virgin, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. The Father calls Gabriel back to the throne one final time and gives him a last bit of direction. Jesus. The Gospel of Luke reveals how this message was proclaimed. The angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of my servant David. The virgin's name was Mary. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at Gabriel's words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, since I am a virgin? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, and I am willing to accept whatever he wants. May everything you have said come true. For the census, the young couple has to travel 85 miles. Joseph walks while Mary, nine months pregnant, rides side saddle on a donkey, feeling every jolt, every rut, and every rock in the road. That night, Mary finds herself in completely unfamiliar territory. She doesn't recognize this place or this road. She doesn't even recognize her own body. It has been impossible to sleep, impossible even to rest. As she and Joseph press on into the night, Mary cannot help but wonder. Lord, this is not what I expected from my firstborn child. I have had to endure the sly glances and whispers from the boys in my village. I have been hurt by the way girls I thought were my friends have deserted me. And now I am so far from home and from the comfort of my mother's wisdom and experience. I feel like I am facing my destiny alone. And yet I cannot help but remember the words your angel spoke to me. I know, this is no mistake. He called me by name. By the time they arrive, the small town of Bethlehem is crowded with travelers. The inn is packed. People feeling lucky if they were able to barter for even a small space on the floor. Now it is late. Everyone is asleep. And there is no room. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The birth would not be easy for the mother or the child. Every royal privilege for this son ended at conception. A scream from Mary knifes through the calm of that silent night. Joseph returns from the stable, breathless, water sloshing from the wooden bucket. The contractions are not enough, and Mary has to push with all her strength, almost as if God were refusing to come into the world without her help. With a final push and a long sigh, her labor is over. The Messiah has arrived. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among them. The baby Jesus sighs, the divine word reduced to single syllable sounds. Then for the first time, his eyes fix on his mother's. 
the light of the world squinting. Tears pull in her eyes. She touches his tiny hand, and hands that once sculpted mountain ranges cling to her finger. She looks up at Joseph, and together they stare in awe at the baby Jesus. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His baby's eyelids grow heavy and begin to close. It has been a long journey, and the king is tired. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Do you ever wonder if anyone stopped to ponder what had happened to the young couple who came into town the night before? Did anyone ask about their welfare? Mary and Joseph were possibly one of several families turned away that night. No, it is doubtful that anyone gave the couple's arrival any thought at all. Everyone was just too busy. The day was already upon them. There was simply too much to do to imagine that the impossible had occurred. That God had entered their world as a baby. Are we truly any different today? It is easy for us to look back and see how they missed the most amazing moment in the history of humanity. But would we fare any better if he came to us this way? No, truth be told, we miss the amazement of this greatest of all gifts every day. We get too busy with our lives to think about the one who gives life. Too consumed with present things to consider eternal things. We proclaim his majesty, but miss the moment. We call him Lord, but make no room for him in our lives. We say he is the savior of the whole world, but don't trust him in our little corner of it. How quickly we forget that it is not in the busyness of this world that we find God. It is not in the hustle and the bustle of the season that the true gift is found. It is in the stillness, in the peacefulness, in the tranquility, in those rare quiet moments in our lives and in our souls that we find communion with our God and receive his greatest gifts. And tonight, in the stillness of this place, he offers us his greatest gift, the gift of his son, our Savior. <laughs> Paul tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And at his second advent, that is going to happen whether we confess him or not. But his first advent gives us the power and the privilege to bow our knee willingly. I'm not up here to give a sermon. I'm up here to take five minutes and tell you who Jesus is and what he did. John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was at the beginning with God. And all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. But the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the first 24 of my 48 years, I did not know the truth, and I had not experienced God's grace. But I have now. And it's my privilege to get to share that with you. See, John goes on and he says, There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, 
and the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to be called children of God, to those who would believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 24 years ago, God saw fit to open my eyes to the beauty of who He is. And I would pray tonight, I know there are people in this room that don't know what we're singing about, what, what you're hearing about, that have not experienced grace and truth meeting together perfectly in the incarnate God-man, Jesus Christ. And I remember... I remember what it was like to be in the darkness. And it breaks my heart to know that there are people in this room that I love who may not be in the light. If you see him tonight, whether it's in the songs or in the story, receive him tonight. Don't put it off. You never know. There may not be a tomorrow for you. Don't wait. The peace of God comes from peace with God. We all live forever. We all have an eternity. The only question is address. We will live for eternity in the light of of the throne room of God, or we will live in darkness apart from Him. And Jesus Himself, 30 years after the day we celebrate now, said Himself, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It sounds exclusive, doesn't it? I know the world wants to tell us that, that Christianity is too exclusive. It's, 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 it's too narrow. Take it up with Jesus. The answer is Christianity is the only religion in the world that provides the answer because it is the only religion in the world that says God did it. We don't do anything. He doesn't need my good works. He doesn't need my good will. That's what makes grace, grace. That's what makes the cross, cross. And I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness could come from me doing good stuff, then Christ died for nothing. The manger, the, what started in a manger, ended at the cross of Jesus Christ. And if I could do it by being a good person or by praying enough prayers or by going and knocking on enough doors or whatever it is, then Christ died on the cross for nothing. And, and God would not put his child on a cross for no reason. He did it because he loves us and he wanted to redeem us back to himself. So he did it the only way he could. And that is by coming here, becoming a man, that he may take on the sins of men and die for us. Acts chapter 4 makes it really clear that there is no other name given to men among heaven and earth by which you may be saved. There is only one way. It is exclusive. Jesus is it. But the offer is completely inclusive. It's to everybody. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For he redeemed with his blood a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whomsoever would believe in Him would never perish but have eternal life. That whomsoever believe in Him would never perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through Him. That's the offer. God made it. I'm not making it. This is not me. God made the offer. 
if you see him tonight, receive him tonight. Let's pray. So Father, I thank you, Lord, for an amazing story. An amazing story of grace and glory. An amazing story of redemption and restoration and rescue. I thank you that 24 years ago, you called me out of the darkness and into your marvelous light that I might proclaim the excellencies of you. Lord, apart from you, we all are sinners. For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, but you, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together through Jesus Christ. That is what Christmas is. It's not a story of a baby in a manger. It's a story of redemption. Lord, I pray right now for those in this room that do not know their part in your story. that have never tasted grace. I pray that they would humbly confess before you right now their need for you. All of us need you. And Father, I pray that they would look at this amazing story of a God who did what only God could do, that you came here and lived a perfect life and died our death that we might have life in you. And Lord, that, that those that don't know you would, would see you in this moment and ask you into their hearts. Receive the free gift of grace. When asked, what must we do to be saved? You answered simply, repent and believe in the gospel. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that don't feel like we've got to figure you out to receive the gift of grace you offer. May we receive you in full. May we experience your peace and love and hope and joy to the full. And may we live the abundant life that you promise, knowing that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And it's in his magnificent, mighty, and majestic name I pray. Amen. of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. So the shepherds hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. There were angels announcing the Savior's arrival, but only to this band of blue-collar shepherds. A magnificent star shone in the sky to mark his birthplace. But only three foreigners bothered to look up and follow it. Surely God could have made a bigger deal of the birth of his only begotten son. But that is how we would do it. It is not how God planned to usher his grace into his world through his son. 
And so with barely a ripple of notice, God stepped into the warm lake of humanity. Thus in the little town of Bethlehem, that one silent night, the royal birth of God's son tiptoed quietly by as the world slept. Just take a second and look around before we blow out our candles and go on with our night. And Let me pray just for the rest of our evening and um, just continue the celebration um, for what it is. And that is the celebration of the greatest event in the history of the world. So Father, we just thank you for that truth. Lord, I thank you that um, we need look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ to see proof of your overwhelming, unrelenting love for us. Lord, as we continue to celebrate the greatest event in the history of the world, your coming here, may we do so in your peace, your love, full of your hope and joy. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas.